Welcome, friends. We're so glad you could join us again for our journey through the Psalms. Today we find ourselves in Psalm 82. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to turn to that Psalm. We're going to jump into its contents, contents here in just a moment. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer together before we begin our journey. Father, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for life. We thank you for the beautiful weather that we've been enjoying. We thank you so much, Father, for your handiwork that is all around us. We see your power and your magnificence everywhere we look. Thank you for being God. Thank you for being a just God and a fair God. And thank you for standing in your throne room, Father, and ruling from that throne room, heaven and earth. We give you all allegiance and praise and honor and glory because it all comes to you and you deserve it all. Help us as uh, your stewards, Father, to be good stewards of our time and of our uh, efforts that we might strive to broaden the borders of your kingdom. Thank you so much for the church. We thank you for Jesus who died to make the church possible with his own blood. Father, we just ask your blessing to be upon our study today of Psalm 82. Help us to rest in the fact that you are the judge of all the earth and that you will do right by men. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 82, let's look beginning by way of a little bit of background. Now it's interesting because there's not a ton of background information in this psalm as with last week's psalm as well. The author is Asaph, the same author that we looked at last week. But there's really no historical uh, context of a specific time when this was written. Uh, we don't know the occasion as to why Psalm 82 is written, but as we study it, you'll see that the occasion is pretty clear. Maybe not one specific occasion, but we could see that the occasion is certainly applicable, and it's as fresh then, uh, or as fresh today as it was when it was first penned. We'll notice that in our study that this is going to be a theme of, um, of over the world and society in general. Asaph, uh, by way of summation, is really frustrated in Psalm 82. If we sort of sum up the psalm, it looks like Psalm 82 is a frustration psalm. He's frustrated. What's he frustrated about? Well, when we go through it, we'll see he's frustrated because he looks at the world around him. He looks at civil leaders and he sees their unfairness and their partiality and their bias. And they're not doing the things that they are supposed to do. And he's frustrated with that. And he calls upon God to arise, God, and judge these people. Judge them, Father. Bring them to their knees. Because Asaph is living during a time when everything in his civil society isn't fair. Well, you know, that's applicable for today. That's applicable in every day. Civil societies aren't always fair. Uh, people in high offices don't always <laughs> operate uh, with discretion and with morality, do they? I hate to say it, I, I would never speak poorly of America. I love America. I'm thankful to be an American. And I honor those who've given their lives and time so that I might enjoy freedom today. But let's face it, folks. We live in a day and time when our leaders are, for the most part, corrupt. Uh, that's just the truth of the matter. We see scandals in Washington all the time. We see, we see people lying. We see people double-tongued. We see immorality at the height of, of many of our elected officials. And that frustrates us, doesn't it? We put men and women in and we expect them to serve us. That's their job. That was Asaph's frustration. God, why aren't they doing it fairly? Why aren't they serving the people like they're supposed to? The civil magistrates and judges, and perhaps even the king, had misused their office for unholy purposes. And Asaph was frustrated. He saw the abuse of power, and he knew that it must be condemned, and it must be judged. Psalm 82 is an inspired record of Asaph calling upon the judge of all the earth, God Almighty, to bring justice to these crooked civil leaders. Someone has correctly called Psalm 82 the judge of the judges. And if you think about it, that psalm is exactly what this is. There are a couple other psalms that could be read along with Psalm 82. I'm just going to give them to you and you can read them in your spare time. Psalm 50, Psalm 75, and Psalm 81. All three of those kind of go with the same theme of Psalm 82. Again, that's Psalm 50, Psalm 75, and Psalm 81. 
It's a general theme that the psalmist was looking at. His elected officials, or at least his governmental officials, weren't behaving properly. They were immoral and ungodly. They were not sticking up for the defenseless and the widows and the, the orphans. They were, in fact, they were using their power and their office to actually put down people in weak positions. And so it is the case that the psalmist is frustrated and so he calls upon God to arise and to judge these people. This psalm is so applicable to us because I know we get frustrated at times with our elected officials. We get frustrated at times with our governmental system. We live in the best governmental system known to mankind, but it still is not a perfect system. And there are times when injustice does prevail. And so we need to learn from Psalm 82 how to behave and how to act during those times. Well, let's look at an outline. As we go through the outline, we'll read the psalm. And I think we're going to find some consolation, some comfort from what Asaph has to say. The psalm divides itself really into three main points. And then, as usual, we will divide them down a little bit further. Number one, we see the power. Look at verse 1, Psalm 82, verse 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Now notice gods there is small g, and so that's important to note. The power. Well, under this idea of power, number one, we see the authority. Look, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. Now, it is the case that the authority of God is clearly seen in this very opening passage of Scripture. God's authority, He's the one that stands before all these people. He's the one that stands before presidents and kings and magistrates and judges and all these powerful officials. God is ultimately the power. He is the authority. It's kind of interesting because men often believe they are the authority. But dear friends, there is no authority except that which comes from God. If you have your finger, just hold it right there in Psalm 82 and turn over to Romans 13. I love this passage. Romans 13 is the, the case where Paul really deals with, with the very same theme as Psalm 82. He's dealing with the higher authorities, those who are officials in civil leadership. I love verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now notice the second part. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be ordain, or are ordained of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. He's saying that, that God is the one that has ultimate authority. It's, it's not the president, it's not the house, it's not the senate, as it were in our uh, system of government. God is the ultimate authority. And I don't know about you, but that opening verse helps me. It helps me to remember that I don't need to get all bent out of shape over injustice and all the, the immoral things that happen in government. I don't need to do that. Why? Because ultimately God's in authority. He puts them in authority and He is the one that stands and judges. The power, I see the authority. Number two, I see the action. Look at it. He judgeth among the gods. Gods here, small g, refers to those in civil leadership. And so they do have a position of authority, but it is God that stands over them. And here it is, God is pictured as standing in the midst of all these high civil officials as God fulfills his role as judge and jury. The very opening verse gives us confidence. It gives us encouragement because God is ultimately the authority. Let us never forget that, dear friends. God is in control and he will make everything to be perfect in the end. Now just think about that as we go through the next part. The power, verse 1. Number 2, the prosecution, verses 2 through 7. Let's read that. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. There's a couple things I want us to notice under this idea of the prosecution. They kind of come in pairs down through here. First pair, 
is there's bias and bribery, verses 2 and 3. Look at, I'm sorry, verse 2, bribery and bias. Look at verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly? What's he calling upon? There's bias in the courts. There's bias. They're not looking at these things fairly. There's bias. In other words, they are looking at certain people with favor. Why? No doubt the second part, because they are being bribed. Look at the second part. Um, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? That really has a connotation of bribery. And you know, this isn't far from what happens many times in our legal system, isn't it? Ah, I wish it weren't the case, but the old saying, money talks, usually is the case on earth. I mean, if a person has the best money, the best lawyer, a lot of times he can beat things that he really shouldn't be able to beat. Why can he do it? Because of money. You see, money is corrupt in this aspect. Money corrupts. And so these people are not judging fairly. They're biased. They're accepting bribes. Then secondly, not only that, they are supposed to be defending and delivering. Look at uh, verses 3 and 4. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needed. What he's saying? He's saying defend them. In other words, in the court, the money is, is the one who's talking. And the poor don't have a chance. Those who are helpless, they don't have a chance. The fatherless, they aren't being judged properly. They don't have justice. They don't have any money. They don't have anything to bribe the big shots with, if you will. And so he says, you know, they need to be defended. And really, isn't that the case of a, of a civil leadership? What is civil leadership's job? We're going to see it as we get down through here a little bit more clearly. But a civil leadership is supposed to bring about justice that's their job it's not to look at this man and says well you know what he has a lot of money and so we don't want to offend him and dear friends I'm saddened by this but we see this sometimes don't we in fact we, we've seen this recently with some scandals that have happened in Washington we've seen some people that have been acquitted and overlooked for crimes that they have committed why <laughs> because power and money talk and we've seen it over and over and over again in our history of our country. It's not new. It wasn't new in Asaph's day. And he was frustrated with it. And so he said, start defending and start delivering those who you're really supposed to look out for. You see, the most vulnerable to injustice would have been orphans and those who are physically and financially weak. The public servant should have fought for these people. He should have stood and, and, and been their defender. And yet he made a mockery of it. He, he sort of misused his office and the opportunity. Well, thirdly, there is a shaking and a sobriety. Look at verses 5 and 6. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I call this a, sh a shaking. What's happened? Essentially, the world's kind of flip-flopped, is what he's saying. He's saying that, that they walk on in darkness. Now the foundations of the earth are out of course. They're shaken. They're all mixed up. Why is that? Well, you see, when injustice prevails, the very foundations upon which a society is built is shaken. Society must be built upon principles of justice. And when they're not built upon principles of justice, those foundations are shaking, are, are shaken. And we see that today. We see that in our world today. When, when immorality reigns, what happens to a nation? Well, the Proverbs writer said, righteousness exalts a nation. But the second part is true. But sin is a reproach to any people. We, we see this in our world today. We see sin on the rampant. We see sin on a rampage. And, and it seems like those in high places are accepting this sin. Some of them are the ones committing these sins. And it seems like it goes unquestioned, unchecked. That was Asaph's problem. God, they're not defending the poor and the fatherless. They're not delivering those who are poor and needy. What's going on here, God? The sobriety of verse 6. I love this. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. You see, God allowed men this earthly rank to aid society. That's why government exists, so that we don't have anarchy, so that we don't have chaos. 
And yet sometimes it's the very officials in government that cause the chaos. Why is that? They're not founded upon godly principles. These ones have forgotten that they are appointed by God and they're subject to God. Sobering indeed, isn't it? Now, dear friends, as I stated before, I am certainly proud to be an American. Thankful to God to be an American. But I wonder the sobriety, the sobering thought of those in Washington who vote positively for abortion. They are the ones that are set up to defend the poor and the needy. And they are using and misusing their office to go against the very core and fabric of society. Dear friends, when we do that, we have forgotten, really, the role of government official. They are put there by God to rule, to defend, and to promote unity and peace. And yet, so often, the very opposite of that is true. Number four, we see death and decline. Look at verse 7. But ye shall die like men. What's, what's the psalmist saying? What's Asaph saying? He's saying, you know what, you people seem very strong now. You think you've got it all in order. You, you, you're judging and you're misjudging and you're misusing your office. But he said, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to die just like, everyone, just like everyone else. You're going to die and then notice, secondly, decline. And fall like one of the princes. You know, someone has said death is the great leveler. Earthly rank does not continue in the grave. Let me tell you, those who are in high offices today, those who are misusing those high offices, do you know where they'll end up one day? They'll end up in a grave. And that earthly rank will not follow them into the grave. In fact, it won't matter if they were president or a senate leader or a house majority. It won't matter what they were. They will die and they will be placed in the same type of tomb that all mankind will be placed in. And guess what? One of these days, they'll be called back from the earth, uh, from that grave. They'll be called back to stand before the judge of all the earth. And let me tell you something. One of the first things on God's agenda on that great day will be, why did you misuse your office? That will be a very sobering thought. These people who thought they were in charge, thought they could make these ungodly decisions, God says, it's going to come back to haunt you. Dear friends, I take solace and comfort in that. Because it frustrates me at times when, when leaders vote for ungodly things. Much like our nation is facing today. Many, many things have gone by the way, by way of sin and, and depredation to our country. But you know what? I don't have to get too worked up. Because ultimately, God will be the judge. They will stand before God. And dear friends, they will give an account. And so, when we are abused by government, we don't need to fret. We don't need to worry. God will make it right in the end. I promise you that. And then lastly, we see the psalmist, not only uh, does he show the power, not only does he show the prosecution, but lastly, he brings out a plea. Look at verse 8. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit the nations. He pleads with God. It's almost as if he's saying, God, are you asleep? Arise, wake up. Now, I don't believe Asaph thought God was asleep. I'm sure he knew God was awake and alive and powerful. But it seemed to him like God was sitting in the background allowing these things to happen. I can relate to that, can't you? Doesn't it sometimes seem like, like evil prevails and evil's controlling everything? Let me tell you, dear friends, that's not the case. God is very well aware of what is going on. He is more than able to handle it. And he will handle it in his time. Remember we said a few weeks ago, God doesn't settle all his accounts on Friday. We need to remember that, especially given the situation at hand. God will bring out the things of this earth, the sin-filled uh, civil leaders that have plagued our country and many countries before them. God will bring them out, and he will call them out and judge them according to their deeds. What is the application here? How can we make application of this psalm? There's some great things I learned about God from this psalm. Number one, I learned about the judgment of God. It makes me, you know, rest a little easier. God will judge all wickedness. You know, so many times we want things to be right on earth. I want things to be right here, God. 
And so I'm going to push and I'm going to make a big deal about things that aren't right upon the earth. Let me tell you something, dear friends. God will judge all wickedness. He'll judge it. I need to wait on Him. God will judge fairly and without partiality. You see, sometimes in our civil law, in our civil courts, the whole story's not known, is it? I, I can think in my mind of a couple of, uh, of superstars, a couple of athletes that have gotten off on things that, that you or I wouldn't have had a chance of getting off on. I mean, they sinned, they committed crimes, and they were acquitted. Under what premise? Are you kidding me? Well, it was unfair judgment. All the facts weren't presented. But you know what? When it comes to God, all the facts will be presented. He judges fairly and without partiality. He knows the hearts and motives of mankind. Thus, nothing will be withheld from God's verdict. We look on earth and we say, well, that person, you know, they should have been punished and they weren't. Well, they weren't punished today. But one day they will be punished. And God will make sure of that. He knows the heart. He knows what they've done. He knows the whole truth of the matter. In fact, dear friends, He knows what no civil court or civil authority can know. He knows their heart. We don't know the heart of man, but God does. I learned something about the judgment of God. Number two, I learned something about the heart of God. God is compassionate. He will not turn His back on those who are oppressed. He cares. And so it reminds me of the first century. You remember when those Christians were going through great persecution, brought on by the government, brought on by Rome, by Nero, and by Domitian? God didn't forget them, did He? He said in Revelation 2 and verse 10, Behold, the devil's going to throw some of you into prison that you might be tried ten days. Be you faithful. I'll give thee a crown of life. What was God saying? I see what's going on. I will make an end to this one day. I will bless you for the persecutions you're suffering. Secondly, the idea of the heart of God, I see God is impartial. He sees the value of all people. No one's worthless, no one's disregarded. Sometimes in our court systems, that's not always true, is it? If you're not well known, have a lot of money, sometimes you sort of get shoved to the side. But not so with God. Everybody is of value. God is honest. He, he certainly will only bring truth to the forefront. God knows the entire story from beginning to end. I don't know about you, dear friend, but that makes me rest a little easier today. It makes me to understand that, you know what, God knows the whole story. He sees the heart. He sees the injustice. Just give Him time. He will take care of it. Number three, not only do I learn about the judgment of God and the heart of God, but I also learn about the power of God. God is the owner and creator of the earth. Sometimes we forget that. We forget that He controls this earth. He's in charge. Oh, I know Paul would say the prince of the power of the air. It seems like the devil's in charge of the world. The devil's not in charge of the world. He's the only people that have authority on earth is the authority that God will lend them. Remember Jesus as he stood before Pilate? Pilate said, man, do you know who you're talking to? I'm a judge. <laughs> Jesus said, you'd have no power at all except it came from my father. That's the truth of the matter. Our president, our house, our senate, Whatever, uh, whatever civil leadership there is, our local government, our governor, he would have no authority at all except it come from God. This is a stern warning to leaders, to civil leaders. You had better pay attention to the precepts of God when you judge and you rule a society. Because let me tell you something, you are not from the judgment of God. You will not pull yourself away from the judgment of God. You will stand before the judge of all the earth. And He will judge you. God is the one that is powerful. God is the judge and jury of earth's inhabitants. You know, He is the one that rules. He is the one that judges. And He is the jury. Everyone will answer to God. Yes, myself included. Every one of us will give an account before God. Romans 14 and verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We will give an account to God of the things we've done in the body. And so it's very sobering for us to understand the power of God. Then, fourthly, I see something here about civil government and God. I think this is important to note. Sometimes we forget this as Christians and as humans, and especially when we're blessed, as blessed as we are to live in a free country like America. Civil government was given for man's good. That's the very purpose God set up civil government. It was for man's good. 
Civil government functions as God's servants. That's what they are. You go read Romans 13. Why are they there? Because they are there to keep, to keep evil at bay, to keep things without being chaotic and anarchy. We're supposed to have a system that is organized. Civil government offends God greatly. And this is important. Civil government offends God greatly when it functions with partiality and bias. God is offended by that. Civil government must be maintained by godly principles of justice. That's how the government should work. It should work looking to justice. Now, this is something we need to make sure that we understand clearly. Right now, we sort of live in a, in a biased society. How about the media, dear friends? How about the media? Do you believe the media is unbiased? What's the media's job? The media is to be, if I might steal a phrase, fair and balanced, aren't they? They're supposed to just present the facts and then let the American people make a decision. But such is not the case today. It's hard, in fact, it's hard to believe any of the media. They twist things to their own agenda. That's not fair. That's not the way God designed it. Civil leadership must be maintained by godly principles of justice. And therefore, civil leaders must strive above all for justice. That is their job. To get to the heart of the problem. To fix the justice system. To make sure that things operate as fairly as possible within that governmental leadership. That's government's job. But dear friends, I'm afraid that many in our government have forgotten that. They've thought about this as a, a long life career for them to pad their own pockets. Dear friends, that's not God's idea of civil government. God's idea of civil government is to protect the innocent, to plead for the fatherless, to stand up for those who are oppressed. That is civil government's job. Mankind has a way of getting all stirred up and frustrated when civil leaders do not fulfill their office with integrity. I can understand that. I get agitated with it as well. But you know what? One thing we must remember, God sees all, hears all, and knows all, and He will judge all of mankind. And it will be fair one day. Everything will come out. It will come out one day. Those who abuse power will not be acquitted, and justice will be served. Now, dear friends, I hope that gives you the fortitude to go on. I hope that would take some anxiety from you and some frustration from you. It seemed that when Asaph ended this psalm, he was just calling upon God to arise. Arise, O God, judge of the earth, for thou shalt inherit all the nations. Father, it is your battle. We sing a song often in our assemblies. The battle belongs to the Lord. Many times we get involved in battles that aren't ours, dear friends. God will fight this battle. He'll fight it for us. Let's stand and watch the power of God. And if we don't fully see it today... Hang tight. We'll see it one day when the judge of all the earth arises and judges the impartiality and the bias of civil leaders. This is an encouraging psalm. I know Asaph was encouraged when he realized that God was the power. Dear friends, we can rely on God. We can trust in God. Let us not become too consumed with worldly affairs, but let us allow God time to do His work. Next week, we'll be looking at Psalm 84. And so if you want to read ahead, you can read Psalm 84. We're going to look at a psalm from the sons of Korah. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to study God's Word and to go through this journey with us through the Psalms. May God bless you until next time.